which I made a simple example. Um, sorry, this is a little boring because it's another 16-tone sequ sequencer, but this one, if you listen to it carefully, acts not quite like an analog synth. You can't really get an analog synth to do this exact thing, but you can get kind of close to it. So, no, let me slow it down. The basic deal is the timbre of the sound is changing during the life of the sound. So it doesn't just go beep 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 like a Hammond organ. It, the sound is brighter in the beginning than in the end. Actually, I need to slow it down some more. There. So you can hear how the sound is brighter at the beginning than at the end. Now, there are two fundamental ways in electronic music that one does this, um, of which you know one. The, the one that people reach for if they are used to working in studios is a filter. Uh, but I haven't told you about filters yet, and I might not even be able to tell you about filters in this quarter, depending on how things go. Uh, the other way is by wave shaping, the, just the technique that you've seen so far. So those of you who've played electric guitar have probably noticed that um, if you put your amplifier in overdrive, then the volume control on your guitar is actually a tone control, because the higher you, you the more you saturate the amplifier, the more brilliant the, the tone becomes in some sense. Um, that's the same technique as what computer musicians call wave shaping. And that's, that's what's happening in this patch here. So this is just it's nothing but a sinusoid going through, oops, sorry, going through a um, <coughs> skillfully chosen transfer function. Not that skillfully, actually. And um, the thing that changes the timbre of the output is just changing the amplitude of the input. So, so if you, well, I'll show you this in, in the patch, but the basic trick to, to making timbres with computer music or using computers, the simplest way of doing it is, is so-called wave shaping where you take anything that you want, which you presume is some kind of periodic function, but the sinusoid is perfectly good. Uh, control its amplitude and then pass it through a nonlinear transfer function and then probably control its amplitude again so you can turn the thing on and off. And then the first amplitude control actually changes the timbre of the sound. And I can prove it by example. Um, oh, actually, before I prove it by example, what I'll do is start this back up and show you what the controls are that I gave, uh, that I put on it. Um, um, there's, of course, a speed control. The duration. Uh, you all know how to make envelope generators. Envelope generators are just line tilde objects with messages that turn them on and off which um, you saw in the, in the polyphonic example last, actually the, the homework was due this coming, Tuesday, this coming Thursday has a, an envelope generator in it which you need in order to be able to turn sinusoids on and turn them off uh, in a way that ramps in time. So this is, this is that same thing almost. Um, it's actually a monophonic instrument. There's no polyphony here at all, um, which is therefore more like what an analog synthesizer would have done. The sequencer is nothing but looking up a nice table using a metronome and, and modular arithmetic to go through the table, exactly like in the previous example, I think. And the timbre variation is happening just using an envelope generator. And I'm not even bothering to control the amplitude except right at the output here. And this is just a, a change on in the timing of the envelope generator. And it's useful to be able to change this. And that's it. That's the whole thing. And you can, you know, turn this thing on and run the tape and you can sound like Morton Sabotnik, sort of. Not, not quite exactly. Um, the extra credit example is similar. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, this is, this is not as, um, what's the right word? This is not as imaginative as I was hoping. Uh, it's the same extra credit as, as during homework three, but in homework three it was almost impossible to do. And actually, did anyone actually do the extra credit for homework three? which was the, that was the eight note, it was an eight note sequencer where every third note had to have a different timbre, which was just hard, right? I hope it was, it was hard for me, so I hope it was hard for you. Um, if you if you do that, but, but uh, driving with a metronome, everything becomes a great deal easier. Uh, you just didn't have that 
you just didn't have that way of doing things before. So now it's very easy to do this kind of stuff. And all this changing now, it's not, I'm not actually having to do any weirdness about turning oscillators on and off. That's just changing the parameters to go to the envelope generator that's controlling the thing which I'm going to define later, which is called the index of modulation. That is the amplitude of the sinusoid that you're putting into the wave shaping function. So that's for, that's homework number seven due on the 24th, a week from Thursday. Uh, you, of course, are all still working on homework six, and that's cool. Um, but I wanted to show you that so that you, so that uh, you will have some context or some sense of direction as I sort of show you again, painfully, whatever you say, uh, didactically through the, the ABCs of, of wave shaping. This is, um, this is the most pop. Well, if if you look at wave shaping in its um, in its most general form, this is probably the most popular way there is of making timbres with computers. And so there's a fair amount to know about it. Although there's a great deal more not to know about it because it turns out that in most situations, what wave shaping does is mathematically very difficult or intractable to analyze. So you will. You can use simple examples to sort of guide your way through designing instruments, and then when you're designing real instruments, the simple examples will give you intuition, but they won't give you exact answers that apply to the complicated situations. So the the example that you've already seen is this one. Uh, take a sound, clip it from any two numbers. Uh, I think I was using zero, minus 0 0.2 and 1, and then listen to it. And out comes uh, sound that's clearly not a sinusoid. Okay. Um, one observation about this. Yeah, I don't know if I. Oh well, let me let me uh, show you the other function that, that you've seen first, and then make an observation. Actually, two observations. First observation is the, the very simplest one, which is how would you make uh, make a time varying timbre using this technique? And the answer is. Um, just what I said, take this thing and multiply it by something that varies in time. So multiply it by the output of a line tilde and make, no, we don't need, that's just the sinusoid, we're going to get rid of that, so you don't have to listen to that, right? Okay, so we're going to multiply this by the output of a line tilde and then clip it. And the line tilde is going to be controlled, let's see, in this case just a plain old linear control is going to be good, so I'm just going to take whatever I have and pack it with a decent interval of time and just make there be a number box. Oh, let's have it let's have it in hundredths though. Alright. And now we have this is not going to be great or anything like that. This is just going to be sort of basic. So the oscillator, so of course when I'm multiplying by nothing, nothing comes out. So if I multiply by, say, a tenth, here's <coughs> oscillator. Oops. It's very quiet now. Well, uh, I'm going to cheat and make it louder at the amp. I'm not sure that's a good idea or not. We'll see. Okay, and now as we multiply it, oh, I, oh, sorry, I don't want to do that. I'm doing something stupid. <laughs> this is how to teach yourself how powerful your amplifier is, but I don't want to know how powerful this amplifier is. Okay, I'm dividing by 100. I did not want to put 0 0.1, I meant 10. So now I'm going to go back, turn this down, and do this right. Okay, so 10. There we go. Sinusoid, right? Now, you all know this, but as I turn this up, if I, if I put 100 here, this is multiplying by 1. And therefore, I would get the that sound. And of course, sounds in between are sounds in between. So now I have the very simplest possible whammy bar that would control timbre. All right. Oh yeah. And it, of course, if it's negative, negative amplitudes are the same as positive. So if I was doing this in a way that, um, if I was doing this for someone else to use, I would make this thing have a range, like I don't know, zero to five hundred so that it won't go negative, and then I can have this. It's going to work. All right, computer music instrument. OK, this 
is a little dull, um, but it's only dull because, uh, well, the main reason it's dull is just because there's only one function so far. Right, so what can you do with this? Okay, first off, let's try other functions besides clipping. So I'm going to just copy this clip function so that I can get it back later. And meanwhile, I'm going to do stupider things, like, for instance, take the signal and square it by multiplying it by itself. Right. And now, I get nothing, and as I turn it on, I get, and this I showed you last time, it goes up an octave, because when you square something, well, there are two ways of thinking about this, why that happens. The, the way I told you last time is, oh, it's just a trigonometric identity. The square of the cosine of omega t is nothing but cosine 2 omega t plus 1 all divided by 2, which means that if you square a pure sinusoid, you will get something at double the frequency. If you take the sound of your guitar and square it, you will not get a thing that is, a, that is an octave up. That only works for pure sinusoids. A guitar signal or any other kind of real signal that you record will have overtones, and those overtones will, when you square them, will not just get squared individually. They will you'll get something else. Okay. Meanwhile, um, I should tell you something else about this, which is, um, this is good, but in general, with nonlinear transfer functions, oh, let's get the, actually, while I'm, uh, while I'm here, let's do the, let's get the clip thing back. Oh, I can leave this here and have a clip too. How about that? So I'm going to hook this over to the clip thing, and I'm going to make another output object so we can listen to that too. Okay, minus something, plus something, I don't know. <coughs> now let's hear it. Oh, no, why, oh yeah, we're going to have to turn this up. Okay, we're clipping now. Now, here's the thing about that. If you take a, if you take two oscillators, oops, sorry. If you take two oscillators and, and give them different frequencies and add them. By the way, um, I keep, I've mentioned this once in passing and should have mentioned it again. Um, adding two, uh, if you connect two signals to an inlet, they will be added. So this, now if I want to give this thing, say something else, a fifth up, if I can do that, that's 325. Oh no. Oh right, that's this yeah, this is it. Sorry, that's not a fifth up, that's some that's some interval of it. I don't know what interval that is. Okay. So that's a thing. You hear two sinusoids, and now when I start pushing it to the point that the thing clips, I get stuff. Well, okay. The clip tilde is a nonlinear function, and when you send signals through nonlinear functions, not only do sinusoids turn into things that are not pure sinusoids anymore, that's called harmonic distortion in, in, in uh, stereo review. Um, the other thing that happens is when you take, put two different sinusoids or, or give a signal that has more than one sinusoidal component in it, they will, as, as it's called, intermodulate. And what that means mathematically, well, hand wavily mathematically, is that um, there will be distortion products which are not just functions of the one and the other, but cross products of the two. So to go back to the simple example, so this was the complicated example with the, oh yeah, with the uh, clipping function, right? The simple example is, going back to just squaring the thing, hello, why don't we hear anything now? Hmm. Oh yeah, I've turned this thing off. Okay, so I'm going to push it all the way up, and now we're going to hear, oh yeah, good. So the, now with the clip tilde function, by putting a low amplitude in, I was able to get, um, I was able to use just the linear portion of the, of the clip function. So the clip, clip function, if you graph it as a function, is flat and then linear and then flat. Right? Because clip just lets the value through until it clips. So if you only, so if you don't let it clip, if you give the value that's less than, than the value at which it clips, then everything that goes in will go out. And in particular, here, this sum of two sinusoids is just two sinusoids again. Oops, sorry, I didn't turn it low enough to, for that to be true. Okay, 
And then as I push it up, we get distortion products, uh, intermodulation products, as uh, stereo people would call it. So for the, in the sinusoid case, the thing is not linear anywhere. In fact, if you like, the sinusoid is, sorry, if, if you square a sinusoid, well, that, that means your, your lookup function is a parabola. And the place where a parabola is least like a line, if you like, is right at the origin where, it's, where it doesn't have any slope. So here, uh, 250 and 325, uh, those are these pitches. But here they are not there at all. What there is, is this sound. That's, that's an octave above this. Furthermore, you get an octave above this. Okay, so now we got and whoops, come here. And then if I put them together, you'll get a, another pitch, which is about and another one, which is something like that. I can't get down that low, right? Two other pitches that were not there in the original. Actually, none of the four pitches that you hear. This is better than a real example because it's in harmonics, the point that we can actually define the points in the harmonics. So we're going to do something like that. Do you get those three pitches? Four pitches, sorry. Okay. What happened? Well, this oscillator by itself made one pitch and it also made DC by the way. This one also made a pitch and it made DC. But as you all know, A plus B quantity squared is A squared plus B squared plus 2AB. That means you get the square of the first one and the square of the second one, but even more you get the, the product of the two. So a part of, so one component or yeah one component of, of the output of this multiple of this squaring function is this times this, the cross term. And that cross term is what's called intermodulation. And these two pitches were the, those two pitches were just double the original pitches and these two pitches were the sum of the two frequencies and the difference of the two frequencies. Right? Oh. You've already even seen this because if you multiply two oscillators, that's ring modulation. So what you get is the sum and the product of the two frequencies. So here you get the sum of these two frequencies, which is whatever that is, 575. You get the difference, which is 75. And then you get double this and double that. All right. Uh, of course, if we gave it a harmonic sound, if I gave 500 here, then we're just going to get a nice harmonic sound. And there, the component frequencies are going to be double 250, which is 500, double 500, which is 1,000, but also 250 minus 500, which is, sorry, 500 minus 250, which is 250 again, and 500 plus 250 is 750. So I actually get 250, 500, 750, and 1,000. about this? Yeah? I don't realize that um, the sum of the difference is 2AB. Yeah, so, so it's 2 times the cos, you know what, I really should have a blackboard, or you should use the blackboard, but it's going to be a mess if I do. So it's, so this is the, what's coming out of here is the cosine of 250 times 2 pi t coming out of here is the cosine of 500 times 2 pi t. And then when you multiply those two, it's the cosine of one thing times the cosine of another, which is half the cosine of the sum plus the cosine of the difference. That's the, that's the trig formula you need. And where do I have that written down? Let's see. That's in, on the, that's in the book somewhere, but I'm not going to be able to remember where right now. So that's, so that's why you get the sum and difference frequencies. Yeah, I'll go try to figure that out. It should be at the very beginning of chapter five.
actually, you know what? It's such an important formula. This is the fundamental formula of computer music, right? So let's uh, let's see. I'll go here. Maybe I can actually go up to modulation. And we go to multiplying audio signals. There it is. Uh, this is more than you need. <laughs> this is uh, this is showing you a cosine including the phase and another cosine including the phase term, and then it's this mess. But in fact, it is the cosine of the sum of the two frequencies with another phase, and then the cosine of the difference of the two frequencies with another phase. Okay. Right. And did I find my way back to where I wanted to be? Yeah. Okay. Here. This is a picture of squaring the signal and what it looks like when you square a signal. Gee, it becomes positive, and this is the transfer function. This is the clipping transfer function I was just talking about. Where? Here. And this is what the waveform should have looked like that you heard earlier, except I drew a symmetric one, and then in the patch I did a non-symmetric one. Important detail about that. Um, yeah, I can demonstrate this, I think. Um, it, I mentioned that it's a very special case that I that the oscillator went up by an octave when I took the sine of it, or sorry, when I squared it. But in fact, if I did any even function that I wanted here, what's another good even function? Let's see. Absolute value. I hope there is one of these. Yeah, good. Okay. This is not going to sound nice. This is a this is what happens in analog electronics when you take your nice sinusoidal oscillator and put it through a full wave rectifier. The absolute value is if it's positive, it lets it through, and if it's negative, it negates it so that it's positive again. Okay, and when we do that, let's see, I didn't do this real well. Okay, I'm going to do it like this. Sorry, so this thing isn't working right now because it doesn't have any inputs. So now, once more, oh, let's get rid of this. And let's also be able to hear the original so that you can get that pitch in your ear again. So here's the original pitch. Okay, and here's the result of taking the absolute value of it. Goes up an octave. Okay. This sounds mysterious until you think about it, and then it sounds stupid. So, why is it stupid? The, the oscillator itself, I'll graph the oscillator's output. It's, um, okay, there's an oscillator for you, amplitude one. It spends half its time being positive and half of its time being negative. Now we're going to take this and put it through an even function, that's to say a function whose output for negative values is the same as its output for positive values. An example of an even function is the sine, uh, actually, yeah, 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 sorry, is the second of these two examples. the x, y equals x squared, that's an even function. That's the simplest even function. No, second simplest. How about the function f of x equals 1? Right? And the voltage you get when you hook your electrocardiogram to a dead patient. Right? That's an even function. Okay, this is the next, the next even function up if you think in terms of polynomials, which is one possible series of functions we could look up. In fact, that's the one we're going to talk about later. Um, okay, so it's even. That means that if you put a positive number in or put a negative number in, the same thing happens. And then, lo and behold, the positive part of the sinusoid that goes in gives you whatever it is, and the negative part gives you whatever it is all over again because it's the same. So the result... Um, the result is the same for the first half period as for the second half period. As a result of that, it had to go up an octave because its period suddenly dropped by a factor of two. All right. So that's a more general statement about why squaring a sinusoid sent the sound up an octave. And in general, that would happen if you had a sinusoidal input or if you had no any other kind of input half of whose cycle was the opposite of its other of the other half. That's yeah. If you studied acoustics really well, you probably didn't hear this, but those are things that have only odd harmonics in them. 
Uh, if you do that to a, uh, if you send one of those things into an even function, you will get something that is an octave up because what happens on the left-hand side is exactly the same as what happens on the right-hand side. All right. Now, if it were true that the function on for the negative values was in fact the negative of what it was for the positive values, then you would get the rest of the possibility. The rest is the odd harmonics. Those are the things you didn't hear for even functions, and so hand wavily you might think that odd harmonics would be a thing you would get by sending a sinusoid into an odd function, and in fact it turns out to be true. An example of an odd function that you just saw was this one. So now, for negative values, you get negative what you got for positive values. And as a result, when you send a sinusoid in, the result has the same period as, as you did, as you had before. And furthermore, the result still has the property that the second half of the waveform is the additive inverse of the first half of the waveform. So it's something and then it's minus it, and then it's something and then it's minus it. And if you think about what harmonics would have that symmetry, the first harmonic does, it's positive and then it's negative. The second harmonic loses because it does the thing and then it does it again. So it's the same for the second half of the cycle as the first. The third harmonic goes up, down, up, and then it goes down, up, down. And so if you, if you squeeze the third harmonic into a cycle, it will again have the property that the first half is the negative of the second half. That will be true for harmonics 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on, all the odd ones. As a result of which, if you make a waveform like this, which is, it doesn't have to be positive followed by negative. It just has to be whatever it is followed by minus whatever it is, so that if it's negative in the first half, it's positive in the second half. Then you will have something with only odd harmonics and the typical sound that that makes. Let's see, I do it here. Okay, so this, this clip was, I made it uh, unsymmetrical deliberately in order to avoid having this happen because I didn't want to be confusing or something. But I'll now be confusing. I'll clip between minus 0.2 and positive 0.2. And now we want to graph this so I can prove that it's doing what I'm telling you it's doing. Now we can listen to it. Let's see, so here's the original. And here is the wave-shaped one. And it has that, you know, clarinetty, held nose kind of a sound that one associates with sounds that have odd harmonics. By the way, don't let anyone tell you that clarinet sounds have are typified by having strong odd harmonics. That's true for the first 18 half tones of the clarinet, if I'm not mistaken, after which it's not true anymore. As soon as the little hole goes open, that quits being that quits being how it acts anymore. It's only so but it is true for the low notes that you get these kind of notes for clarinet. And for the first 30 years of electronic music, whenever anyone made a timbre like this, they just happened to have, for symmetry reasons, mostly odd harmonics, they said, oh, it sounds like a clarinet. And so now you can find clarinet voices on your organs or synthesizers or so on. And it's just things that happen to have that symmetry, regardless of whether it sounds like a clarinet or not. To any reasonable pair of ears, this doesn't sound like a clarinet at all. It sounds, sounds like a very cheap computer music instrument. Oh, and what does it look like? Ta-da. What I showed you before. And it, is, and it does have the correct symmetry for having odd harmonics. Now, why am I belaboring this point? Because now I've shown you how you can make odd harmonics and even harmonics. Oh, yeah, I should show you that as a waveform. That, that, was, that was the one where I took the absolute value of the sinusoid. And now the thing can't go through zero because we're taking the absolute value, so the second half of it is flipped upside down so it's positive again. All right, and that of course had to go up an octave. And now, and this is an idea I think that might be originally due to Don Buchla. At any rate, the oldest synth I know of that, that knows about this is Buchla's um, old modular synths. Now we have something where we can 
control the relative strength of the even and the odd partials. Questions about this? Yeah. Um, does it alter the, the kind of relative amplitudes of the harmonics when you divide it? Because if you oh, yeah. can't add those two signals together back together, yeah. Uh, the original sign is sign. No, no. Yeah. So one way of thinking of that is one of one of these only has odd harmonics and the other only even. So Adding them is simply introducing different frequencies, which won't in fact ever cancel each other out. Um, however, you could make a wave shaping function. You could make two wave wave shaping functions, each of which was horribly nonlinear, but whose sum happened to just be the identity function. In which case, you actually would have two funky timbres whose sum was just the original sinus wave again. I don't know if that would be useful, but. Do it. Okay, so this is, uh, oh right, so this is just sort of phenomenological, this is, if that's the right word, Ex um, experimental, intuitive. Uh, this, is, this is just um, very general observations about what kinds of waveforms might come out when you do things. So, so far what we've got is that um, putting two things in will cause distortion products, which are sums and pro uh, sorry sums and differences of the incoming frequencies, or maybe even sums and differences of multiples of the incoming frequencies. That was that was what we got when we took these two things in and when we added these two together and started wave shaping, and then we're getting stuff like this. Whoops! Oh right, it's going to make this 350 again, 325. Okay, so now we have complicated sound and another complicated sound here. Ooh, interesting. Probably no common frequencies, although I can't swear to it. Right? Okay, so that is, oh, let's look at it. <laughs> Isn't that cool? This is the absolute value. This is, this is a sum of two sinusoids, full wave rectified. Oh, that's, that's old fashioned talk. Right, so you you can imagine every other one of these lobes being negative in sign before it got wave shaped, and then the other one, this one, is the same thing clipped. So it looks like this. All right, another observation that's just right there on the surface. Different kinds of wave shaping functions have different behaviors when you change amplitudes in terms of the overall amplitude that comes out. So if you take the absolute value of something, the louder the signal goes in, the louder you'll get out. Right? Pretty much, I mean, if you double a signal, in, in fact, there aren't very many, there aren't very many uh, fun real valued functions like this. Something where if you double the input, it doubles the output. The only ones I know of are the identity function and the absolute value, and combinations of those. Although if you think in the complex plane, you've got a whole bunch more. And that's a very rich source of ideas. Um, if you clip, clipping things means that no matter what you put in, the result can't get louder than between minus 0.2 and 0.2 in this case, right? Which means we have a very uh, sorry word we have a, a very predictable instrument in terms of what kind of amplitude will come out. Right, that's good, or that could be good. Um, in particular, if you've got the well, this is the thing that you get when you put an electric guitar in an amplifier and overdrive it. The cool thing is the amplifier can't can't push its tubes harder than full on and full off. As a result, there's a sort of basic loudest thing that you will get out of a thing no matter what you do on the incoming side, including feedback. Even feedback, which if you put it through a linear system, could, could eventually grow without bounds. If you put it through something that's being clipped, you know, it'll stop somewhere, and then you'll get something that hopefully is, what, is at the level that you want. All right. It's still true. It's true of all these things that... 
well, let's see, it's, it's particularly true of this one, that we still have this nice timbre control, which is, which is louder, gives you a sharper timbre, and furthermore, gives you, interestingly enough, a louder sound. So even though the difference in power between this and this is tiny, this is, this is actually a lot louder than that, or not a lot, but substantially. And the reason for that is psychoacoustic mumbo jumbo. Um, specifically, the loudness at which you hear something is, in some sense, the sum of the loudnesses of the signal and all of the different critical bands that it has energy in. And so even without substantially changing the energy of a signal, if you just spread the energy out over more critical bands, the result will sound a great deal louder because putting a quarter as much energy in four different bands is much, much louder than putting the entire thing in one band. So bandwidth uh, makes loudness in psychoacoustics. And here, what we're doing is we're, we actually have an instrument that changes loudness more by changing bandwidth than by changing the, the acoustical power of the signal that you're listening to. So if you have a if your bassist isn't loud enough, you don't get very far by just pushing the bass up because you just hit the limit of your cabinet. But if you add some overtones, then the bass can be a great deal louder. And if you're mixing music and if you want the bass to be audible, even if you're playing it on a boombox, don't just push the fundamental because it won't come out that speaker. <laughs> add some harmonics and that's what will make it loud. And people will think, oh, that deep bass, even though the actual low frequencies that are the fundamental and low harmonics of the bass aren't even present. Same thing is true even more so with earbuds. All right, and learning how to do that is an art, not a science. Okay, so there's that. Questions about this? Okay. Now I'm gonna go get a little more mathematical. So this was all just sort of experimental stuff with, with stuff like absolute value and clip, which, by the way, are functions which are not pleasant to approximate with polynomials. They are not analytic functions. But now we're going to take the opposite approach altogether and start talking about polynomials because they are the things that we can analyze the most easily when we're talking about wave shaping. So the first example that I showed you of a polynomial was just squaring first non-trivial example. And this was the example, or this was the, the thing that allowed you to just, whoops, oh yeah, got to do this. Oh, now what's happening? Turn this off. <coughs> takes, the, takes the thing and bashes it up an octave. Okay, so this is an even function, so it had to get bashed up an octave. An odd function would be take the thing and cube it. So we'll take the square and then multiply it by the original signal again, and then it's cubed. In fact, while we're at it, let's make a few of these. All right, so now the results of these, so the outputs of these multipliers are going to be the square, third power, fourth power, fifth power, and sixth power of the original signal. Now raising this signal to the sixth power could give you a huge amplitude, except for the fact that this oscillator gives you values between minus one and one, and no matter what power you raise that to, it's still going to be between minus one and one, right? positive power anyway. So in fact, let's see, let's turn this on and tune up a decent, yeah, there we go. So here's the so here's the here's the first power of the signal, which is just itself. Here's the square. Quieter, by the way. Here's the cube. They are getting quieter. Why are they getting quieter now? I'll show you. There's the fourth power, fifth power. You know what? They're getting quieter to the point that I want to get the oh, duh. I'm not doing what I said I'm doing. I want to give this I want to make this full blast. They all have the same amplitudes. I'm sorry. So that was 24. That was a quarter going into there. And so a quarter to the fourth power was getting to be a tiny little, tiny signal. Right. So now let's try this again. But I'm going to turn this way down now. 
Okay, so the original signal square Q. Okay, fourth power, fifth power, sixth power, seventh power. Okay, so seventh power compared to third power is this. So if you just had something that could freely move between different powers of the function, you could have a nice timbre whammy bar, right? Mm, all right. However, oh, and let, let, me, uh, let me quickly graph what happens when you take, let's look at the seventh power of the thing. So that's this thing. And now if we look at it, we'll see. Oh, thank you. I don't want that trace there. There we go. I was getting worried because math tells me that this thing should still be between plus and minus one and it was reaching outside there. And when that happens, you're doing something wrong. Okay. So, okay, so here's the seventh power of a sinusoid and it's sort of looking like a pulse train where every other pulse is negated. And in fact, if I take an even power of it, it looks like a pulse train again sort of accept that. <laughs> now every other pulse is going the same way, going, going in the positive direction. Every pulse is going in the positive direction. Right? That's the even odd thing again. All right. Furthermore, let's do this. Actually, no, no let's do this one. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm going to listen to this for a second. And as I mentioned, or as I showed with the clipping operation, clip, okay, so here, as I change the value, or as I change the volume, or the amplitude of the sound that I'm clipping, it changes the timbre. That's going to be true in general of nonlinear functions. So here too, I'm a little scared of this one, but here too, whoops, sorry, I'm still hearing this one. Yeah. Well, you don't really, it's not so clear. But in fact, the higher harmonics are somehow growing at a, at a steeper rate than the lower harmonics. Well, I can show that to you better a little bit later when I show you some more math. So this thing does have a varying timbre, but the problem is that the amplitude of it is changing in such a way that you don't hear the timbre change because the amplitude change is dominating it. Okay. There might be ways you could deal with that. Right? You might be able to predict what amplitude you should get and divide by it, and I'll let you think about that. Okay. So, now to go back to the equations and pictures for a second. So this is the wave shaping chapter, and then, ooh, let's not do that yet. Um, a little further down here, there's an analysis of what happens when you actually take powers of a signal. Oh yeah, here's here's me figuring out what happens when you take two different sinusoids and, and square the, the sum and showing the intermodulation products, but I already talked about that. Here now is, is it? Yeah, here now is what happens when you just take a nice sinusoid, cosine omega n, where n is the number of samples that have gone by, and start raising it to powers. And this is, you know, just algebraic, it is delight. Uh, the first one is uh, cosine times cosine is a half plus a half cosine double, right? And in, in general, the cosine of a times the cosine of b is a half the cosine of the sum plus the cosine of the difference. And so here, what happens is when we cube it, you can think of multiplying the square by the original one. And the, so you have to multiply this term by this term and this term by this term separately. Right? And then add them. So a half of the, oh, so this one just gives you a half of cosine omega n again, which to confuse the matter, I wrote as a quarter of the cosine of minus omega n plus a quarter of the cosine plus omega n. That's because that's the 
way to write it down so that the pattern will become clear later. And here, the cosine of omega n times the cosine of 2 omega n, that's the cosine of omega n plus the cosine of 3 omega n, and that generated the other half of this one, the other quarter cosine omega n and the one quarter cosine 3 omega n. You've all seen Pascal's triangle, right? We're doing Pascal's triangle in harmonics. Okay, so the next one is, all right, so the, the lowest frequency is minus 2 omega n is, and the highest frequency is plus 4 omega n. It's centered around omega n and not around zero. Right? And now we have 1, 3, 3, 1, all divided by 8. Those are the probabilities of getting 0, 1, 2, or 3 heads and 3 tosses. Okay. And meanwhile, the, the signals that, that have those amplitudes instead of probabilities are minus 2, 0, 2, and 4 times the original frequency. Okay, this is the fourth power, so it's an even function, so we're, we're seeing in mathematics what I told you before by hand-waving, which is that you only see even frequencies when you take the even function. Right. And now the next one, not to belabor the point, that's as far as we're going to go. Um, divided by 16 now, and it's minus 3, minus 1, plus 1, plus 3, and plus 5. <coughs> so one interesting thing about this is if you look at the highest frequency, which occurs all the way to the right, the the highest, the frequency of the highest harmonic is going up one step each time you raise the thing to a higher power. Right. Now someone, I'm not sure who, but it might have been Mark Lebrun in like the early 70s, thought about this and realized that you could, if you were smart, you could just isolate these individual frequencies by cooking up the correct polynomials. In fact, there were, the correct polynomials were easy to think of because they have been known for, I don't know how many hundred years. They're called Chebyshev polynomials. Uh, and Chebyshev polynomials are what you get if you say, I just want uh, the cosine of 5 omega n and I don't want this other stuff. So how am I going to get rid of it? Well, it's easy. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get rid of this one by subtracting out uh, twice this, this whole thing. So instead of taking x to the fifth, I'll take x to the fifth minus twice x to the fourth. And that won't have any of this. T oh, wait. I'm telling you the wrong thing. There is no cosine 4 omega in here. There's only a 3. Okay, so there's 5, 3, which comes in twice, and then 1, which comes in twice. So we can get rid of the 3, the, the cosine 3 omega term, by subtracting some suitable multiple of this, which I can't do in my head. And then we can even get rid of the cosine omega n after that by subtracting the suitable multiple of the first one. And so there is a polynomial out there which is something times x to the fifth plus something times x cubed plus something times x, which has the property that if you put a cosine in, you get exactly cosine of 5 times it out. All right? And since seeing is believing, I made a patch <laughs> to do that. Uh, here's a picture of... of of, I believe, the fifth one. Uh, this is a polynomial that I stuck inside a wavetable. How would you do that? It's work, but you can look inside the patch to see how I did it. And I'm just using tab read for tilde, your old friend, to read values of this polynomial. And then here is nothing but a nice oscillator going in, times a, an amplitude control, which I'm going to call the index. And if the index is 1, that's to say if I just put this thing in with amplitude 1, oh, there's stuff here going on that I'll explain when I have the actual patch out, then out will come the fifth harmonic. Okay, now, I'll, now I'll get the patch out and show you what happens. If I can figure out how to get the patch out. Here. So the patch is in the tedious but essential help browser. We're in chapter 5, so they start with E, and it's going to be the Chebyshev.pd. By the way, this is all stuff I think that you've seen. There it is. And here is the sound of... Let's see, let's throw this all the way up. Here's the sound of whatever... Oh, of whatever this is. So what we're doing is we're computing different polynomials to put in the table... 
And I'm realizing now it's too bad I didn't also just have a linear polynomial. Let's just draw one. There's the original pitch. <laughs> if I could actually, if I had actually made the patch, that would be a cleaner sound. There's the oscillator going through just the function y equals x. Here's the thing going through a suitably designed parabola. Uh, so before you saw me just sort of thoughtlessly square this thing in order to raise the, in order to give you the octave. Here is uh, the, this is the polynomial x squared minus 1 all over 2, which has the wonderful property that it goes between plus 1 to minus 1 to plus 1, and you can compute it if you want, but if you apply that to a sinusoid, you will get the second harmonic term, and you won't get the dc term that you got, and you just squared the thing. So you just square the sinusoid, you get double frequency, and then you get dc term. If you just subtract the appropriate thing from the from the thing, then you get just the second the second harmonic term and nothing else. So now I have polynomials that will take an oscillator, just just take a pure sinusoid, and make pure harmonics out of it. Okay. Furthermore, let's go get this one. Um, Depending on the amplitude that, of the sinusoid that you put in, you get different timbres. So what I told you is only true, in fact, for a unit uh, amplitude sinusoid. Of course, if I put in a zero amplitude sinusoid, I have to get out nothing. I get probably some DC, I'm not sure, but no sound. And in between, I get a range of timbres which sounds like that. Okay. So we're starting to make computer music here, right? All right? And similarly for all the others, so here's an even one, which therefore will sound an octave up. And so on like that. Okay, so this is, this is, um, this is what in the early 70s people thought would revolutionize computer music because no one would ever need to do anything besides this for building timbres until people realize that actually static timbres aren't as interesting, it's variable timbres that are interesting. And furthermore, although you get to control exactly what you want this thing to be when you give it, when you take it all the way to the end, you don't really get to specify in addition what it does on the way up there. <laughs> it just does whatever that polynomial does. And there's no choice about the polynomial. There's exactly one polynomial that will give you that thing at the end. Right. So in fact, you have to be smarter than this if you want to make timbres that actually vary the way you want them to. And how smart do you have to be? You have to sort of proceed by a special case. Everything is a special case from here on out. Particular kinds of functions and particular ways of using them and combining different ones of these will be useful for making different things, and that will be something that I can't really even give you a summary of. It's just the whole field of inquiry. Any questions about this? Yeah. That might have been it. Was it a Yamaha VL1? Oh, it, um, no, you're not old enough to have one of those. <laughs> um, I know the VL1, but it was a Okay. Oh, that one I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, so some people, yeah. So since Yamaha licensed something from Stanford, I don't think Korg was actually using so-called physical modeling, although it wasn't really physical modeling in the first place. Okay. So, and, and in fact, I don't know what it was inside the code. Um, yeah, but it, but to be honest, that that Yamaha thing, the so the original synthesizer that described itself as physical modeling, didn't work like this at all. It was a completely different principle of operation. And so this is this is the this is the easiest way into making varieties of timbres. There are other interesting but more complicated ones too, and you can spend decades learning them all if you want. Okay, so there's that. Um, what I want to do is make another observation. Okay, so just continuing to look at special cases. Right? 
So what are some good functions that you could think of trying that aren't polynomials? Oh, so the problem with polynomials is this. Uh, you don't see it because I've only shown you the part of the polynomial that happens to be the, the good part of the Chebyshev polynomial. But of course, this is a fifth degree polynomial. Its leading term is x to the fifth. And so it's going to shoot out of the screen just as soon as I get a few tenths of a point to either side of, of the part that you're looking at. Right. It's coiled up tight right in that, right in that little rectangle, but that's, it's, that's the only place where it's well behaved. Right. Okay. So polynomials, even though they're simple to think about, are actually very ill behaved in terms of their ampli in terms of the amplitudes that you get out when you start putting freely varying amplitudes in. That's almost the opposite situation from the uh, clipping functions. I don't know if they even have names, but functions like clip tilde where no matter how hard you punch the input, the output is limited to a specific kind of value. And there the only thing is that that's not really an analytic function. That's to say it's not describable very well as a power series, so I can't really tell you by using this kind of mathematical analysis what it's going to do to a signal. In fact, I don't have, I don't have anything besides hand-waving sort of descriptive analyses of what clipping does to signals. There are analytic, that's to say, easy to approximate by polynomial functions which do reach asymptotes like arctangent. But take the arctangent function and take the first 10 elements of the Taylor series and then plot them. The result will not look like arctangent. It'll look like arctangent in the neighborhood of zero. And then, of course, since it's a 10th degree polynomial, it will shoot off to plus and minus infinity. No, oh, sorry, They're, the terms are all odd, so it would be a 19th degree polynomial. So, so, so as soon as you get out past a, a very little bit past the, the well-behaved portion, it's going to blow up horribly. Right. Okay, so how do you get something? Actually, let's talk, let's 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 do the simplest analytic function, which just blows up horribly anyway, which is the exponential function. Right. It turns out that the well, simplest analytic functions are polynomials, but the exponential function is a good one to think about because, as it turns out, you can analyze what happens when you send signals through exponentials, and decent, well-behaved things happen. So let me show you that. Let's see. Actually, I'm going to cheat and just show you this right off the prepared. <laughs> the prepared patch rather than build this for you because um, cause I don't want to build it. Well, there is an exp tilde object, so you can just exponentiate anything you want. But there's there's stuff to do in order to, to exponentiate things well as opposed to just exponentiate them. So how do you exponentiate something well? Um, so here's a picture of a, an exponential table. Since, uh, since we're doing computer music, we're going to run the thing through a digital analog converter, so we would like things to be bounded. And the way to make exponentials be bounded is just to look at the part of them that is, uh, that is um, who, where the exponent is negative. And then it's all going to vary between 0 and 1. So this is the function e to the minus x um, graphed from 0 to 10. So down here, if you could see it, this would be e to the minus 10, which is tiny. And now what we're going to do is we're going to use this as a wave shaping, wave shaping function, but we're going to be smart about it. And the smartness is this. Rather than, um, rather than look in the middle of the function where the thing's about e to the minus 5, uh, we could do that. Right? We'd have a wave shaping function, and the thing would be e to the minus 5, which I forget is uh, maybe a hundredth or so. And so we would multiply the result by a hundredth so we could hear it. And then we would increase the index, that's to say increase the amplitude of the sinusoid we look up. And then we would start going up this thing on one side, and then we would start clipping madly or, or do something bad. And like they, wouldn't, they wouldn't be correct, or at least it wouldn't be the exponential. Also, the amplitude would, would grow in some very unruly way. Right. So rather than do that, the smart thing to do here is to take the, take the sinusoid, but Actually, don't just center it around zero because then it'll go negative and, and that'll either be clipped or else it'll be growing quickly depending on how you realize it. But do the following real simple thing. 
have, have the sinusoid be arranged so that it reaches from zero to whatever point you wish. So now what's going to happen is, rather than, rather than look, um, let me show you this in a picture. Um, okay, so going back to, where'd it go? Ah, here. Going back to here. So these functions are all being read around the middle of the function. Uh, the simpler example was just squaring. Oh, wait. That was the other window. Here, in this wave shaping example, what we're, we're putting a sinusoid in, and a sinusoid is, is variously positive and negative, but, it's, but, it, but the result is in some sense centered around zero. And we're just leaving it centered around zero, not moving that center as we change the amplitude. When we change and uh, when, when instead we use, okay, can I get rid of this? Wait. Yeah, there's the, this is the one. When we use a function like this, it's smarter to have the thing grow from the left-hand margin of the function out, because then we know. So, so whatever the amplitude of the sinusoid is, we will adjust the center of it so that it's so that it reaches from zero to somewhere instead of just reaching between plus and minus something. Okay. So instead of reading around the center, we'll read starting here around whatever point we have to read around in order to get it to start here. How do you do that? You just take the oscillator and add one to it. So that instead of ranging from zero to, sorry, instead of ranging from minus one to one, as the oscillator does, it will now range from zero to two. And now, yeah, it would be, it would be uh, correct at that point to divide by two so that it ranges from zero to one, but I'm throwing correct, or care, care to the wind at this point. And now the index is again a number, it's in tenths now, which uh, controls the amplitude of that result before we go reading it in the table. Okay. Uh, at some point, I want to remember to tell you why I'm doing this, but this times 100 is because this is in fact 1,000 points representing 10. In other words, I have 10 points in the table for every unit of, of input for the exponential function, so that when I do the lookup, it will be decently accurate. So this is correcting for the units of the table. Then we will read, the, read it out of the table, and then we will start graphing it. So let's graph it. Here's a spectrum. Oh, yeah, you saw spectrum. Uh, this is the spectrum of what you get when you have a zero amplitude reading into this, which is therefore putting out solid value of 1. So the index is 0. So this oscillator will be multiplied by 0. So 0 is going in here, and the result is is one whose waveform looks like that, which you don't see, and whose spectrum looks like a peak at DC, at zero frequency. And then as we increase the index, now what happens is, as the original sinusoid goes, well, when the original sinusoid is at its negative peak, so that when adding one, you get zero, then we get one, as a lookup, but meanwhile, as it as it reaches out to whatever wherever it goes, it goes down to some value which will get closer and closer to zero. Right. Furthermore, the hotter you make the signal going in, the faster, or well, the less time it spins in the in the neighborhood of. of the peak here, and the more time it spins out in, in this neighborhood where everything is almost zero, and hence the skinnier this pulse gets. So this is the, I think, this is the good way to make a pulse train in computer music, although there are other ways of making pulse trains. This is, this is a pulse train. You can, you can in fact compute these amplitudes and they turn out to be Bessel functions of the second kind if I'm giving you the right nonsense, but basically you can look at them, uh, what's the right word, you can look at them intuitively and see that what's happening is there, there's a peak here and there's a, uh, and the energy is moving out, um, so there's an increasing bandwidth. Furthermore, as you tweak this peak, the peak itself lasts less and less time, and so in a very non-rigorous way of thinking, the frequencies 
present in that should be growing linearly as the peak gets squeezed, which is to say linearly as this number goes up, if I'm not doing that wrong. So as this number goes up, the energy gets spread out over progressively more and more harmonics. And so to listen to it, you get nothing if you send the index to zero because it's all DC, you can't hear it. And then as you add index, you get this. So computer musicians hear that and they say, oh, that's a brass tone. And actually, if you uh, if you look at how brass spectra change as you put more and more pressure into the brass instrument, they actually do spread out in this sort of way. Let's see, can I actually make this real lighter? Let's see if we can see any more harmonics. Well, you probably can't see the harmonics while I'm changing it very well. Yeah, sort of. So, so the, so the basic idea is the harmonics will spread out fatter and fatter, and to a certain point, you will not hear the thing get quieter, even though the power of the signal is dropping because it's spending less of its time away from zero. Um, because of that psychoacoustical effect I told you before, the energy is spreading out over more frequencies, so up to a certain index, you actually hear a decently nearly constant uh, amount of sound. That will quit being true when I get up past two or three hundred here. Um, in fact, I decided to protect users from this, but now I'm going to unprotect us. See, let's just go all the way up to whatever value we want. And now we get... change the scale. There we go. So now we have, ta-da. That's, um, that's something that people used to do with low-pass filters. Take, take a um, standard analog synthesizer kind of waveform and send it into a low-pass filter and you, you can get that kind of effect. Here in computer music land, it's easier to get it this way, although people still reach for the analog way of doing it anyhow because it, it has a particular quality of sound that makes people nostalgic for the 50s and 60s, 60s in particular. Okay, but this is now a very simple but very effective way of just making one collection of timbres using wave shape. Questions about this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's even better than that. There's a couple of pages of mathematical analysis of what this should do. And what I can tell you about that is this. The Taylor series for the exponential has this wonderful property that for very small value, okay, so everyone knows the Taylor series for E to the X, right? No. No, it's one, okay, so it's one, I was kidding, I know. <laughs> one plus X plus X squared over two plus X, X cubed over six, which is three factorial x to the fourth over four factorial, x to the fifth over five factorial, and so on. <coughs> so the denominators are going up crazily, so that by the time you get to, well, they're not, but anyway, the, 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 the coefficients of the terms go off very, very rapidly, right? Now, one interesting thing about that function is that if you say, what's the loudest, well, loudest, I'll just use that term. What's the loudest um, monomial in that series? Okay. So if, if you put in zero, you get one plus a bunch of zeros, so the loudest thing is the one. If you put in values between one and two, if you think about it, between one and two, x is bigger than one, but x is smaller than x squared over two. And so between one and two, x is the dominant term. <coughs> between two and three, x squared over two is the dominant term. Between three and four, x cubed over six is the dominant term and so on. So you can think of the exponential series uh, as the Taylor series of the exponential as a sort of polynomial whose degree goes up as you push the 
the uh, input up in the sense of the dominating term going further and further out the series as the, as the value of the input is going up. Now, th this is a good way of thinking about it for positive numbers going in. Negative is a stranger situation because they're canceling each other out there. Um, so in one way of thinking then, the bigger a number you put in here, the higher harmonics you're going to get because, as I showed you before, as you start raising uh, as you start raising the cosine, or start wa raising a sinusoid to higher and higher powers, you get those, those polynomial, you get those uh, collections of terms that, that were spreading out in frequency. That was this picture here. Whoa, come back. Oh, where did I put it? I think I put it here. Yeah. No, wrong. It was just here. This stuff. So see how the see how the bandwidth of this thing is going up as you as you as you raise it to higher and higher exponentials. Well, that suggests that the exponential, if you exponentiate something, the you'll get a you'll get a mixture of these things, and whichever one of these is dominant will be the most will be controlling the well, will be the loudest thing in the mix. And so you should expect to see something whose bandwidth increases linearly, in fact, with the, um, with the strength of the signal that you're putting in. Ooh, that isn't quite right. But I won't tell you why that's not quite right. The bandwidth of Pascal's triangle doesn't go up linearly because of the square root of n because it's the standard deviation of, of a collection of coin tosses. But at any rate, you see these things each weighted according to uh, each weighting according to how important this term is in the Taylor series. That, that would be true in it for any Taylor series. You can you can think of it that way. And and for the exponential in particular, since it has this very simple behavior of which term is the most important, you just get a widening and a, and a flattening of the thing as the signal gets louder and softer. And that's exactly what you saw here. Pushing this coefficient up made the thing get wider. Now, the, the, I'm pulling a fast one here because, of course, that, th that analysis w assumed that I was centered around zero, and in fact, what I'm doing is I'm pushing the thing over so that it only reaches zero at the loudest point. But in fact, the exponential function, if you slide an input over, you're simply rescaling the output. That's the quality, that's, that's what exponentials are. They're, they're the same as themselves rescaled when you move to the left and right. And so, in fact, the fact that I'm, re that I'm uh, sliding the thing over in order to control the amplitude is simply rescaling it in, in the perfectly appropriate way to get the thing not only to have the bandwidth property that I told you about, but also to have a well-behaved amplitude as the index of modulation is going up and down. So at this point, the exponential should be your all-time favorite wave-shaping function to try out, except for this one kind of... Um, inconvenient thing, which is that uh, the, the power, the overall power of the signal can be rather small um, if you average over the entire length of the period. And that's not going to be a problem if you have good audio equipment, but if you don't have such good audio equipment, uh, or, well, yeah, if you don't have such good audio equipment, you won't necessarily be able to reproduce these functions as well as you would be able to reproduce something whose power was distributed nicely in time over the entire waveform. So things that are pulsy are great until you, until you put them through a boom box and then they're not quite so great anymore. So this is a good thing for the studio, but you might want to mess with phases or something before you actually put this on a record. Do people use the word record anymore? I don't know. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Um, this is closely related. Okay, so what's the next? What's the other Taylor series you all were made to, to learn in calculus besides exponential? Oh, the, well, there are McLaren series. That's a different kind of series altogether. But didn't you have to, to memorize sine and cosine as Taylor series? No. <laughs> no one took you over those coals, did they? Okay, that's the. Um, all right, yeah, and there's Dimwaber's theorem, which tells you that the, I forgot the right name. Uh, 
sines and cosines are nothing but exponentials, except that they're exponentials of complex numbers in linear combinations. And in fact, the same kind of reasoning that I show you here should suggest also that instead of using an exponential as a lookup function, you might be able to use sine or cosine and get something like similar results. And in fact, you do. And it's even better than that because you're going to get results that you've heard before. Because, am I going to explain this? Yeah. Because you can reduce mathematically uh, phase modulation to wave shaping by, uh, by waves which are sine and cosine, the functions that are sine and cosine. So let me just demonstrate that. Okay, so now you've seen basically three classes of functions, I think. You've seen um, things that are, are consist of linear segments. That's the clipping function and the absolute value. Those are hard to analyze math in terms of frequency content, but are easy to describe in terms of waveform. So they're good pedagogical things. And also, the clipping thing sounds familiar because you've all heard overdrive. Right? Um, polynomials, and then finally, transcendental functions, uh, which have Taylor series, which therefore can be approximated or thought of as, in terms of polynomials. So we're so the, the, two, the two transcendental functions that we're going to mess with is first this exponential and second, uh, let's go back to the one that I'm building here. Okay, so that was, what we just saw was E5 and E6 here. And I'm going to quit using the examples and start just exampling myself. Okay, so here I'm going to save this and then do a save as. And this one is now going to be 3 sinusoid. Okay. So here what we're going to do is throw out this nice polynomial machine and do something much simpler, which is say cosine. And now we have, huh, right, you heard, that's DC, that's the sound of DC right there. Right? And now if I turn the index on, you get this kind of sound. And that sound should be spookily like frequency modulation, right? Because basically it's essentially the same thing as frequency modulation. All right. Now cosine is an even function, which means, or which implies that whatever I put in, oops, sorry, what comes out will be an octave up because, yeah, so there's the original. And here's the cosine. It's an octave higher because it has only even harmonics. If you want to change that, you just do this. Why don't we add some number to that? And since we have about one minute, I'm not going to be... Oh, actually, since we have one minute, I'm going to really be fast and loose and just duplicate this one. Now we're going to add... I'll have, I'll have time to explain this better next time, but if I give you a quarter cycle through, then we're, then it's the, actually it's minus sine instead of cosine. And now I'm looking, now I'm using an odd function, so I get the odd harmonics. <coughs> and in general, for values between here and there, we'll get mixtures of the two. So now we have something like this. Right, which is more FNE, actually, than it was before. Okay, that's something you know you. Well, you've all heard that sound probably. That's the that's the old FM sound that we all heard over and over again in the 70s. Okay, I'll go back to this example next time because I haven't really described this in enough detail to make it clear what's going on. But now it's 10 till, so I should stop.